and yes, thank you for joining us today. We are truly grateful that you are here because every time we come together seeking Jesus and opening God's word, we are an encouragement to each other, right? An inspiration for each other. In fact, that is our mission to inspire people, to inspire each other to know, love, and follow Jesus. And one of the great things about where we sit in history is that we don't have to try to figure out this whole following Jesus thing on our own. There are many generations of people who have gone before us, faithfully walking with Jesus, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, sometimes sacrificing everything. Now, these historical Christians, the the heroes of our faith, can guide us as we embark on a similar journey today. This is what we are doing during this current teaching series called Incredible Journey. We're gathering to inspire each other. We're opening God's word. We're exploring the Psalms while being guided by those historical Christians who have lived out the truths that we find in these passages. After all, the best guide is the one who has been there and has done that. Today, I get to introduce you to Evelyn Underhill. Evelyn was born in 1875, who who had parents who with no spiritual interests. Still, she converted to Christianity in 1907. And from that point, Evelyn began to deeply explore mysticism and spirituality, writing books and essays on both of these topics and how they practically play out in day to day life. Then in 1921, she became the first woman to be asked to give a series of lectures on religion at the University of Oxford. Now, looking into Underhill's life, we don't actually find a series of stories about adventure and sacrifice, martyrdom or revival. What we do find is someone whose contributions didn't come from a single awe-inspiring act, but rather from a faithful, continually maturing life of pursuing God. You can actually see her spiritual growth through many of her writings. Like, for example, I I just mentioned Underhill's interest in mysticism. And some of you began to actually wonder if you were at the right place. Because today, mysticism is a little bit of a strange word. It's something we find ourselves pushing away from, but we're not totally sure why. For previous generations, however, the idea of mysticism or specifically Christian mysticism was much more normal. In fact, many, if not all of the guides we're using during the series were considered Christian mystics. And now this shouldn't cause caution. It should actually cause us to wonder what mysticism really is and how it can be valuable in our lives. And in her early writings, Evelyn Underhill defined mysticism as the science or art of the spiritual life. Now, it's a pretty simple and even ambiguous definition, which is honestly about right for this idea. But we can get a better understanding by noting that one of the most prominent aspects of mysticism is that it is a spiritual experience that can stand apart from institutional religion. Now, this doesn't sound so bad. After all, we all actually want to have spiritual experiences that cause us to be more aware of God, to to engage with him in intimate relationship. That's, That's actually why you are here right now, to understand how you can better follow Christ's ways in your personal life. We strive to incorporate spiritual disciplines, our our rooted rhythms that allow us to see God for who he is. These are good things. This is to be a Christian mystic. However, the way we more likely understand mysticism is not just that it is a pursuit of spiritual experiences apart from institutional religion, but that it has become a purposeful resistance of institutional religion. Because of this resistance, we perceive mysticism to be full of excesses, distortions, extreme experiences, and spiritual elitism, making the spiritual existence experience the goal rather than the means through which we know God. This was the concern of one of Evelyn's mentors. He wrote to her, I do not at all like this craving for absolute certainty that this or that experience of yours is what it seems to yourself. He doesn't like that she's defining the relation, the experience. And I can, I am assuredly not going to declare that I am absolutely certain of the final and evidential worth of any of those experiences. They are not the articles of faith. By all means, believe them, if and when they humble and yet brace you to be probably from God. But do not build your faith upon them. Do not make them an end when they exist only to be a means. 
This summarizes the journey that Evelyn took throughout her life. One of realizing the means versus the ends. She, she discovered that the starting point was not the spiritual experiences or this state of higher consciousness, but rather the start was God and his gracious initiative in her life. In fact, in the 12th edition of her book titled Mysticism, she commented that if she were to rewrite the book, she would give more emphasis to the predominant part played in the soul's development by the free and prevenient action of the supernatural in theological language by grace. In other words, if she were to write this book again later in her lifetime, she would give more emphasis to grace. Underhill's new understanding of the priority of grace and its impact on our souls did, did not make her any less interested in spiritual experience. Her understanding of grace actually made her more attentive to the work of God as the foundation for these mystical experiences. She was now paying more attention to the work of God, to his grace and his impact on our souls. And with this new understanding, Underhill became a sought after spiritual director whose letters were consistently filled with encouragement to trust in God's grace. Now, one of the dilemmas I often find when looking back on a story like this is that when we summarize a life of growth, of, of faithfulness down to a few sentences, it makes it all sound so simple. I mean, I read a biography and just think, if I just do what they did, I'll have it all figured out within a few days. By the end of the week, I'll be trusting God more deeply. Um, it makes it sound like Evelyn Underhill went on a pretty quick journey, right? She figured it out and then carried on with the rest of her life. And then I begin to doubt things and I think, why can't I seem to figure this out as quickly? Why can't I seem to trust God as easily as Evelyn did? Now, she must not understand what I'm going through. She, she doesn't know my pain, my heartache, the ringer my kids or my spouse is putting me through, the details and the demands of my job, the bills I have to pay. I don't have time to trust. I just want the pain gone. I want the perfect marriage, the stressless job, no bills and no sickness. I just need a miracle now. And if I don't get a miracle, I don't know how I'm going to make it through. <laughs> The doubt just causes things to unravel quickly. But it can be easy to feel like these past figures are out of touch with our reality. Now, obviously, Underhill was human too. And although we summarize her story quickly, she understood the challenges that came with trusting God and his grace in his lifetime. In fact, she wrote much about perseverance and spiritual discipline in the, fact of the, in the face of discouragement and obstacles. She understood that trusting God, and especially in the time of discouragement, is an exercise in faith. And it may be true that some people are more trusting than others, and some may even have the gift of faith. But the reality is that we all need to exercise our faith in God. So even when our experiences may look different from our guides, what does exercising our faith look like, especially when everything seems against us, when our world feels like one big discouragement? Psalm 27 is a psalm that many are familiar with. Even, even if you don't know the whole psalm by heart, you may have heard lines from it offered as a, a goodwill offering, a goodwill encouragement or exhortation because somebody thought it related to what you were going through. For some, this psalm is a go-to in times of need and discouragement. It's a, it's a prayer that I've actually used to, to build up my confidence, right? And, and for whatever the day may hold, especially if that day holds a fight. Now, the heading of this psalm is of David. This simply means that it was written by David or for David. And while it's not universally agreed upon, tradition does suggest that this particular psalm was written by David. However, this psalm is not actually tied to any specific story from David's life, but its examples are imagined from real life possibilities. If this psalm was meant to point us back to a particular story, we would see something more specific, something more like the heading in Psalm 3 that says, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Psalm 27 is more like many of the songs that we actually sing today, where the lyrics may come out of a specific season in a songwriter's life, but the lyrics don't actually tell a specific story, just the truth of the lesson learned or a particular revelation. 
So this Psalm tells us something about what David learned through his experiences, something about how he exercised his faith during hard times. So let's dive right in and start in verse one. David writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. I don't know about you, but I read this and I, I sure do wish I had this kind of confidence. David must have had some special gift to be able to say these things. Well, no. The whole reason that David needed to bring up these scenarios and express this confidence is because there was actually something to fear. <laughs> these scenarios come straight out of David's experiences. He actually had to worry about armies and invasions and enemies. And even though our worries and fears may not, may not be the same, they are just as real. Fear of sickness, fear of accidents, of abuse, fear of the future, fear of the past. Honestly, I was afraid to deliver this message right now. I'm afraid of whether I'll do a good job, be understandable, get it right, even be liked by you. And just like David, I had to remind myself before getting in front of this camera that the Lord is my light and my salvation. I have nothing to fear. Even if I am misunderstood and even if I am disliked, even if my words get all mixed up, I will remain confident because I'm good enough and I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. Well, maybe that's not exactly what's being said here, but the first thing we do see is that we exercise our faith by affirming what we know to be true. See, it's so easy for us to forget that God has, what God has done for us and through us in the past. But one of the first things we must do in times of discouragement, in times of fear, even when we don't feel like it, is to remember what our God has done and remind ourselves that we can be fearlessly confident in our God. We don't do this to pretend like there's nothing to fear in this world. We affirm what we know in the midst of fear and discouragement. We lay the foundation for being able to trust. Now, let's continue in verse four. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon the rock. I used to hear this passage and I always think about the day when the new heaven and the new earth will be established. I think, yes, I can't wait for the day when I will get to live in one of those houses that God is preparing for me. But when you take a little deeper look at this passage, you realize that this idea of living in the house of the Lord is not a future reference, but a now desire. See, the house of the Lord is actually a reference to the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was essentially this portable temple, a place of worship that God instructed Moses to build during the time that the people of Israel were wandering the desert on their way to the land that God had promised to give them. And while they were on this journey, God would show his presence through, through a cloud resting on the tabernacle. And when the cloud would lift and go away, it was time to pack up and continue the journey. So the house of the Lord is a reference to the tabernacle and the tabernacle is a reference to God's presence. David is saying, all I want to do is be in the Lord's presence for all my days to see his beauty, to think about his ways because he understood that the best way, the only way to overcome his fears is to enjoy the constant presence of God. This is the point in which Evelyn Underhill would want us to consider our own personal responsibility. She'd say that because of what God has done, because of his grace, it is now our responsibility to seek out spiritual experiences that allow us to draw the beauty of God into a clearer focus. To be in God's presence provides a place of safety, a place of clarity, a place where we don't have to worry about the forces of this world. What David is showing us is that we exercise our faith 
especially in times of discouragement and fear, by seeking the Lord's presence. So where is your tabernacle? Where can you go to find shelter, even for a moment, from the things that are causing fear? We know we can't ignore life or pretend like the struggles don't exist, but do you have a place that allows you to uniquely gaze upon the beauty of the Lord? Now, I am an amateur hunter at best. It's something I started getting into a little later in life. My, my oldest son took an interest to all things outdoor when he was about eight years old, and I've been playing catch up ever since. And now over the years, my expectations of a good hunting trip have changed. I used to be confident that, that we would put some meat in the freezer, but it didn't take long for that bubble to burst. <laughs> now I am confident that I will meet the Lord. I've shared stories with my wife and friends and even the staff about how God has revealed himself to me while sitting on the side of a hill for hours at a time, not seeing a, a single animal, <laughs> but knowing that I saw the Lord in his beauty. I was hidden in the comfort of a shelter and I came to understand more of his ways and plans for my life. So where is your tabernacle? It could be the mountains or the beach. It could be even a specific room in your house or a special chair. It could be the park where you take your daily walk. It could be within the gathering of friends or yes, the church building. David is suggesting that there are times in which we need to step aside from the fearful distractions and come under the shelter of our heavenly father. We know that we can't stay in this place. We do have to return to day-to-day -day life and life might come back at us fast. But when we exercise our faith by seeking the experience of being in the Lord's presence, we find ourselves releasing control of whatever we are going through. We give it back to the Lord. We let him work things out while we simply gaze upon his beauty. Evelyn Underhill says it, it seems so much easier in these days to live morally than to live beautifully. Lots of us manage to exist for years without ever sinning against society, but we sin against loveliness every hour of the day. See, we keep control. We try to fix things. We try to narrate our own stories and do what's right. But as we try so hard, we miss and sometimes maybe even ignore the beauty that is our Lord and his presence. Go to the Lord. Go to the house of the Lord. Rest in his loveliness and worship. Well, we continue in, in verse seven. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. God, my savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. Now, at a quick glance, this prayer seems to be in contrast with the rest of the psalm. For after affirming what he knows to be true about God, after spending time in God's presence, now David seems to be afraid again, afraid that something will come between him and the Lord. But the truth is that when, when we are reminded of who God is, what he has done for us, when we enter his presence and gaze upon his beauty and worship, our hearts will tell us to continue to seek his face. But how do we do that? How do we do that when we are not in the shelter of the Lord's unique presence? Because see, when we seek experiences that give us a clear vision of God, we know that he is there. His face is not hidden. We know that he has not rejected us. We know that he has received us. But when we are living daily life, this world has a way of casting doubt, causing us to wonder if God is still there. During these times, we exercise our faith by redirecting our attention to the Lord. 
Notice that David's prayer here is not a remove me from this situation now prayer. (laughs) He's not asking for comfort or peace. He's asking God to not turn his face away so that he can learn the ways of the Lord. And when David says, lead me in a straight path, he is asking for steady progress, not for a quick fix. This steady progress recognizes the distractions along the journey and redirects our attention onto the Lord's face. It takes our eyes off of the setbacks that tempt us to quit and fixes our eyes on our light and salvation. I can count, well, I really can't count, (laughs) a number of times that I've prayed for a quick fix, an instant resolve to a situation that I found myself in. On occasion, I do believe that God has answered that prayer, but most of the time I hear God saying, I could do that. I could fix this situation, but then you wouldn't see me. I'm not really sure that I like this answer. I don't like it when he says this. I feel like I would see him in the big miracle that fixes everything right now. I'm pretty sure that if he snapped his fingers and displayed his power, I would be on my face worshiping right now, right here. But, but okay, God, let's go with your plan. Just, just, just tell me what it is. Give me the instructions. What is, what is on the to-do list so that I can check off the items that will assure that I see you? What do I have to do to change my situation? Well, we come back to verse 13 and it says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So again, I might be tired. I might be worn down, unsure and afraid, but I remember what the Lord has done. And I still have confidence that I will see the Lord. I still have confidence in his goodness. So again, what do I need to do? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Wait. Just wait. It sounds kind of simple, I know, but many of us don't wait well, right? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We, we wait with this impatience. All right, God, I've, I've waited I, like for an hour. I guess I'll go take care of this mess. I'll clean it up myself. We wait by trying to tidy up reality, by trying to fix things that aren't ours to fix. My wife once, my wife once said, you can't Febreze the crap out of the manger. And yet we still try. We still try to to clean things up. We still try to make it smell better. We still try to make it look better, even seem better. But instead, we just make the mess worse. We make the piles bigger, the valleys deeper, the heartache more painful. And then God says, are you ready now? Just wait. Wait. Wait by affirming what you know to be true. Wait by seeking the Lord's presence just for the sake of his presence. Wait by continually practicing the redirection of your eyes on our heavenly father. For waiting on the Lord, trusting God, trusting grace, exercising your faith is a long journey. Evelyn Underhill reminds us that although we wish it weren't so, saints were not made in a day. We must nurture and strengthen our trust, our faith, through exercises of spiritual discipline and religion. It's a, it's a long process that needs prodding and seasons of renewal. It needs quiet contemplation of the revelation God. And, and she would counsel us to be simple and dependent Acknowledge once for all that plain fact that you have nothing of your own. Offer your life to God and trust him with the ins and outs of your soul as well as everything else. She also would go on to say, keep the deep, steady, permanent peace. In the long run, it is more precious and more fruitful than the dazzling light. It's the steady course, not the ecstasy that counts in the end. 
In Psalm 27, David is not simply giving us a nice prayer to overcome a brief moment of discouragement or fear. He, he is demonstrating for us a total way of life that clings to God in desperately overwhelming situations. It's a way of life that doesn't get rid of the discouraging moments. It doesn't pretend like we are not afraid, but as we wait in hope, the hardships of the world give way to what is really important. Our situations gain the proper perspective as we remember everything that God has done for us, everything he has done to secure our salvation. This is what the apostle Paul speaks of in his letter to the Roman church. Paul is writing about the the sufferings and frustrations we all face. And as we close, I just want to, to read Romans 8, 31 through 9 for you and even over you. Maybe you even want to join me and read it aloud wherever you are at as we affirm together what he knows to be true. Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, who then is the one who condemns. No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Trust in the Lord. Take the long journey. I can't tell you what will happen with the situation you've probably been thinking about, about your job, about your marriage, about the relationships. But I can promise you that when you lay it down before the Lord, when you take the long road of trusting grace, you will find and fall more in love with the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus Christ. It truly is an incredible journey. Well worth the waiting. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are so grateful for your word, for these Psalms, for for David who has written to us about the things he has learned. And now we take them, Lord, and I pray that, that as we go about our days, you would remind us who you are. Remind us what you've done. Remind us that no matter what our situation here is right now, you are still good and we can still trust your goodness. For we're so grateful for what you have shown us already and we can't wait for what you will continue to teach us and show us as we continue on this long journey. Thank you, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you're able to join us today and we would love to see you in in person. We have three locations with multiple services at each one. You can find all those times online as well as the many other ways that we can can come together in community. But for now, thank you for being here. Have a great week, everybody.